with my Samela Mafumo. Mark Thompson. Make it kind. Get woke. God bless you. Get woke. Folks, MIP is now COVID free, meaning free to all subscribers as we navigate this pandemic. We're thinking about everyone and we've got to get through this together. So for a limited time, no fee to subscribe to make it plain on your favorite podcast app. Ladies and gentlemen, one need not be these days a presidential scholar to observe what is going on and be very, very curious because there are things happening that we've not quite seen in our lifetime. My guest today is an expert in the cabinet, presidential history and US government institutions. She is scholar in residence at the Institute for Thomas Paine Studies that I own a college and senior fellow at the International Center for Jefferson Studies. She also teaches on the American presidency at the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University. Previously, she was a historian at the White House Historical Association and a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University. She is the author of the award-winning book, The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution, published on Harvard University Press. Dr. Lindsay Shervinsky is here with me. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yep, that's great. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you and how are you and yours faring in this pandemic, first of all? Well, thanks for asking. Um, I'm actually, you know, I've been really lucky. My family's been really healthy. I have a roof over my head. I have food on the table. So all things considered, um, what I generally refer to as COVID fine. So, you know, I'm, I'm just fine. And beyond sort of my family and the pandemic, it is a very tumultuous time uh, in the world and especially in our country. So sometimes I'm a little tired, especially as a scholar of the presidency. My work sometimes feels a little too relevant, um, but that is, I guess, a, a good problem to have. And I just am sort of waiting to see what happens next, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to get comfortable with one event because another one it seems to be right around the corner, doesn't it? Yeah. And particularly now, because Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, and Congressman Jamie Raskin, a good friend of mine, are talking about the 25th Amendment. So let's start there, since that's so <laughs> relevant. Uh, although... By the time this is over, there might be something else going on. Who knows? But (laughs) let's talk about that for the moment. Um, The 25th Amendment, if I'm not mistaken, was was not around at the creation of the cabinet, was it? No, that's right. The cabinet actually, amazingly, isn't in the Constitution and was a creation of George Washington in response to real-time pressures and trying to grapple with the challenges of what it meant to actually govern in a world that like to throw things at you, you don't necessarily expect. And so the cabinet has evolved since then, but almost all of that evolution has been organic. It's not been in legislation or in any sort of constitutional amendment. And so the 25th came much later as a response to some real health crises by presidents like Dwight D. Eisenhower and those that followed him, recognizing that It's one thing for a president to die, and the Constitution is pretty clear what happens then. But if the president is sick or under anesthesia or what happens if a president, God forbid, gets Alzheimer's, what is the mechanism for replacing that? And so the 25th was put in place so that that kind of question could help be answered a little bit more smoothly. What are your thoughts about this this current discussion um, around, I guess, the 25th and some type of commission or what have you to see just what is done, especially in the current situation where the president has COVID, he's 
you know, either rage or steroid tweeting. I don't know. But but <laughs> what do you think about th- this current move? Is this does this make sense? Is this a natural evolution, you think? Well, I think it's important to have the conversation. I mean, in our particular moment, it is a little bit hard to distinguish between steroid induced tweeting and regular tweeting, to be honest. And so it's kind of hard to figure out where you draw the line there. Um, But I do think that the conversation at, at the base of it, what it's basically saying is we can no longer count on a vice president or um, the cabinet to act responsibly all the time. And we can't count on them to say, hey, this isn't right. And we need to look into this because those positions have become so political and have become so, especially in the current administration, so wrapped up in the president's success. And so I think the point of the commission is to say, should there be an independent body that can evaluate whether or not the president is up to the task? Because the role is so enormous and the responsibilities are so enormous that um, you need to have someone who is, you know, at their fighting weight under the best of circumstances, let alone in the middle of a pandemic and a crumbling economy and all of these things. So I think that conversation is really warranted. Um, you, you mentioned the cabinet and, you know, perhaps some of his shortcomings today. What was it like when it first came to be? It's a great question. So Washington didn't actually create the cabinet until two and a half years into his administration, which most people don't realize because they watch Hamilton or, you know, they've um, read biographies and they recognize that people like Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton are in office. And so they assume, okay, well, the cabinet was there from the beginning. And that really wasn't the case. So About two and a half years into his administration, Washington decided and he realized that there were issues that were so big that he couldn't just have one advisor or they didn't just touch on one department like the Treasury Department, but instead they had to do with matters of war and diplomacy and finance. And so he brought together his secretaries. Usually he would submit a list of questions to them ahead of time to kind of give them a sense of what he wanted to discuss They would meet privately in a very small, in his small private office, and they would discuss these issues. And then based on what they said, if they disagreed, which in the first administration, frankly, was more likely than not, he would ask for written advice to um, make sure he had all of the information, to make sure he had heard from everyone. And then Washington would make a decision and they would all sort of implement it. So it was a much more private, it was a much more personal advisory body than what we think of now when we see the cabinet on television. Mm-hmm. Um, has, have most of the presidents functioned that way with regards to the cabinet, where there's some instances where the cabinet had more weight in some administrations than others, or were there even instances where it, well, this may be the one, <laughs> where it may not matter at all. It's like, it's just exists in name only. It's a great question. What's really remarkable about the cabinet is that it is such a actually flexible institution. And so each president really puts his stamp on it, hopefully someday her stamp on it. Um, and so some presidents have worked great with their cabinet. Lincoln is a really good example. FDR is another great example. Some presidents have completely ignored their cabinet. So um, Andrew Jackson actually went through three different cabinets before he could find a group of men who would agree with him on everything. And he finally then kept them in office. Um, Andrew Johnson uh, hated his cabinet and uh, actually tried to fire them, which brought up articles of impeachment in the House. So that's definitely a low a low moment in cabinet uh, leadership. Um, But more often than not, there is something in the middle and presidents will be close with a couple of secretaries and not as close with the others, but might also have some advisors outside of the administration, whether it's former colleagues or friends or business people that they know um, that they rely on. And it's it's some blend in the middle. Do we find that many presidents through history at least began with some idea that the cabinet would be there um, to advise and be constructive 
uh, and as you know, as a, a a group to gather to help make decisions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think any president. Well, most presidents don't enter office thinking that they know everything and thinking that they their cabinet will be a disaster. Um, most presidents enter into office hoping that they will have really good working relationships with their cabinet secretaries. And it's just a matter of whether or not they're able to accomplish that. I mean, I will say, based purely on numbers, every every president has cabinet turnover. Every president has some scandals. But based purely on numbers, this cabinet has had more turnover than any administration in the past. Yeah, yeah. Has, has there been any administration that relied on the cabinet as a collective advisory or decision-making body more than any other? administrations? That's a good question. So I would say that as a as a group, as pulling everyone together, it's been a long time since that has been something that presidents have done. Um, in the 20th century, presidents tended to rely on particular individuals more than the group as a decision-making body. Um, Lincoln was a great example of someone who did. Jefferson actually had a really great relationship with his cabinet. And I would actually argue that although Jefferson and Hamilton came to hate each other. Washington really relied on the entire group of secretaries to inform his decision-making process. Mm -hmm. But because the cabinet has gotten so much larger and there's the national security advisor and all these other positions, um, that, that concept of bringing everyone together to make a decision has sort of gone by the wayside. And presidents have preferred to meet with one or a couple of advisors if there are, if there is an issue that touches on a couple of departments. And with all the, the turnover and chaos that we've seen in the current administration, um, what impact do you think that might have on the way administrations govern in the future and on relationships administrations might have with their cabinets? Well, I think that most people who are observing the turnover and the chaos recognize that it is detrimental to the government because the secretaries and the departments that make up the cabinet are responsible for most of the policies that affect Americans on a day-to-day -day basis. So social security and mail delivery and national security and you know financial payments during crisis, things like that, that is all related to the cabinet. And so if you have people in the cabinet who either don't know what they're doing or are not experienced enough to actually fill that role properly, or uh, if you have acting secretaries who are not legally authorized to be there, then that is a problem because that means that there is someone who the Senate has not confirmed as a experienced, knowledgeable advisor and bureaucrat for the president. I think the long-term implications of that chaos will probably be something like there is right now a, a vacancies act that requires the president to appoint a new secretary in the event of a vacancy. And I think it's 210 days. Trump has ran roughshod over that um, regulation. So my guess is that that will be made a little bit more powerful. And I think that Congress will probably take a more active role in overseeing some of those relationships going forward, because the idea that we leave the executive branch to its own devices to do the right thing is no longer working. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You've also um, written about um, what the founding fathers um, offered in terms of foreign interference. It, is it you think appropriate to consider. And I, and I think we can all stipulate cabinets are a good thing. <laughs> you know, you, you want, I mean, ideally when everyone's working together and there's, there's advice that the president can have, you never, who wants to be a singular person making decisions on their own, of course. Um, but what we're looking at now, don't we have to wonder um, whether it's it's pretty much a, a strategy of destabilization. So we've been kind of operating in this way for over 200 years. 
had cabinets. This is kind of the way things have been going. And all of a sudden, everything gets blown up. And we know that there's at least one foreign actor that the president has been tied to whose stock in trade is chaos and destabilization. I mean, isn't isn't that worth taking a harder look at analysis? Absolutely. And I uh, the article that you're you're mentioning that I wrote about talked about how in 1793, France and Great Britain were at war and both had foreign actors in the United States that were causing some troubles for the administration. And Jefferson was very pro-French and Hamilton was very pro-British. But even with those divisions, and even though they hated each other more than two people have probably ever hated each other, they still came together and said that uh, American neutrality had to be respected. And they defended the nation against these actions by these foreign adversaries. And so my point of the article was if they can do it, surely we can find a way to say, you know, Russian meddling in our elections, which are the bedrock of democracy, should not be tolerated. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, there has it has become a political football to say that Russian meddling occurred. And I don't know how that's possible because the facts and our intelligence agency have been really incredibly clear about it. And a bipartisan committee did an investigation in Congress and they said that there was this meddling. So I don't understand how it is possible that people can still deny that, but yet that has become a political reality. And so I do think that there needs to be some reckoning with that. And there needs to be reckoning with the cabinet has a responsibility. The secretaries have a responsibility to uphold American security. And sometimes that's abroad if it's, you know, the Department of State or militarily if it's the Department of Defense. But it's also elections and it's the dissemination of information. And so the cabinet should be expected to take a role in defending the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've also written about Supreme Court. And now there's a lot of conversation about whether or not a, a Biden administration per se. Well, first of all, you've got the uh, uh, Trump and the Republicans wanting to rush a nominee through. It, well, let's start there historically. Do, do, do you know whether there's ever been someone nominated this close in an election year? So uh, my understanding is this is the closest, I could be wrong, but my understanding is that this is the closest to an election and especially because we have early voting. So people are already voting. So we are in an election when this is happening. Um, there was an election, uh, there was an opening on the Supreme Court before Lincoln's re-election campaign in 1864. And there have been some conversations about this in the news. And actually I believe Kamala Harris mentioned it in the VP debate the other night that Lincoln actually left it open because he felt that it would be inappropriate for him to fill it. Um, now, of course, there isn't anything in the Constitution that says anything about when the filling, when vacancies are supposed to be filled. It just says that Congress is supposed to determine the number of seats and the president is supposed to appoint them. Um, but there's no doubt that this is a unusual situation because of the fact that the election is currently taking place. And, um, you know, four years ago, it was deemed inappropriate in an election year, let alone during an election, for a seat to be filled. Yeah. But it was deemed inappropriate subjectively yes. by the same people who were deeming it appropriate <laughs> today. Yes. And that's, that's why correct. a lot of us are losing our minds. But there is um, precedent for expanding and contracting the number of members on the Supreme Court, isn't there? Absolutely. Um, the article that I wrote about the origins of the Supreme Court for Governing Magazine Online basically says that if we're going to talk about Supreme Court precedent and we're going to talk about the origins of this institution, the truest and most central character of the Supreme Court is one of reform and change because it has been changing and evolving and contracting and expanding basically since day one. And the first Supreme Court was six people, and it didn't actually sort of solidify at nine until after the after the Civil War. Mm 
And even then in, you know, 2016, it was eight for a whole year. So there is no hard and fast rule that says it has to be nine people. Right. Right. Um, and I think under the circumstances, um, with the way we've seen some of the political manipulation, it, it only, if we're talking about having a diverse representation of people in this country, um, it's something I would think that has to be seriously considered and not just dismissed. Would, would you not agree? I do. I think that the, for me, the best way to think about it is that the Supreme Court is really not supposed to be a political institution. It's supposed to be one that offers um, rational law-based analysis, and it has become incredibly partisan. And that partisan, the extreme partisan tilt that will happen if Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed is not healthy for the country because it does not reflect the majority of Americans. It does not reflect the political situation. And it does not really reflect what the institution was supposed to be initially. And so for me, it's not a matter of political, you know, tit for tat or anything like that. It's about let's try and make the Supreme Court actually reflective of the American people and as balanced politically as we can so that it can serve the purpose it's supposed to serve. Yeah, yeah. I, I have always been, and this may be outside of your lane, but I've always been, had sort of a curiosity about um, other political systems in other countries, including the British. And so it's always, you know, very well documented, the cabinet meeting, the cabinet room, and the way that operates. And it just, it seems to me, I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, that in that individual cabinet members, um, while the prime minister is the head, which is their president, the individual cabinet members um, still have a lot of influence. And when they're in that cabinet room, there seems to be at, at least the perception of some, some equal standing <laughs> to some extent. Am I, am I wrong about that? No, you're not. And I think the the real difference that comes from the fact that uh, the cabinet in Great Britain is made up of people from parliament. So um, whereas in our constitution, we have an explicit prohibition that if someone is in the executive branch, they cannot also hold a position in the legislative branch. And so the prime minister cannot dismiss cabinet secretaries, whether it be like actual physical dismissal or dismiss their ideas as easily because the prime minister requires their political support and needs to have that sort of coalition building in order to maintain control in parliament because whichever party is in power and they of course have a multi-party system, which often requires some coalition building, which I actually think is not not a bad thing um, and uh, requires them coalition building. And so he has to take into account what they have to say, because if he loses all of that support, then he loses his position. Yeah. So the country from which America escaped colonization actually has a more representative coalition in its cabinet than we do. We do, even though it's a monarch. That's interesting, kind of paradoxical. <laughs> isn't it uh this is very interesting so um folks obviously we're going to be watching things very very closely as they evolve and i know dr shravinsky you are going to be remaining quite busy in the days to come D just curious what are you are you anticipating anything uh after election day i think we're all kind of bracing for some legal battles and and what have you if that happens in 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 numerous states or anything like that that too will be a first time um historical event wouldn't it yeah so it, i mean it's hard to it's so hard to say because um some of the actors are quite unpredictable mm -hmm. um and to be honest i have some ptsd from 2016 so my ability to prognosticate is slightly thwarted <laughs> by those concerns. Um, I th so, I mean, I think it's really important to remember that most states have their own election laws. And so most of the ways that ballots are counted and results are reported 
the federal government has nothing to do with. Um, and so that means if states like Florida and Ohio, which count their absentee ballots as they're coming in, and so are much more likely to have results on the night of the election, if they go a certain way, um, if they go for Biden, I think that the likelihood of post-election shenanigans goes down a little bit because it would be so obviously ridiculous. Mm -hmm. If those states are too close to call, or if they, if for example, Florida does go for President Trump, that of course does not mean that he will win. It just means that we it might take us a little bit longer to know who has actually won the election. Um, my, you know, most up for a very long time, Americans did not know the results of the election on the day of the election. In fact, in the election of 1800, they uh, Americans started voting in April and they finished voting in the fall. They didn't know the results um, until February, and it was actually a tie. And the only time it went to the House of Representatives to determine, and it was a tie between Jefferson and Burr, and it took them, I think, 36 ballots to figure it out. So Americans used to be much more patient for their election outcomes. I would encourage all Americans to continue to be patient and, um, you know, just continue if, if don't be dissuaded from voting because every vote absolutely counts. You have a right to vote. If you are in line, you have a right to vote. Don't allow anyone to intimidate you otherwise. If there is intimidation, report it. And um, if you can vote early, I think that's great. Drop off your absentee ballot in person if you can. These are all things that will help make the process clearer and um, hopefully less chaotic. Folks, Dr. Lindsay Shervinsky has been my guest. Check out the book, The Cabinet, George Washington, and the Creation of an American Institution. And she's also been prolific uh, writing. You'll be doing more writing of articles and publishing, I'm sure, uh, and other interviews. We're happy she's had the time to stop by and make it plain today. Thank you, Dr. Shervinsky. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. All right. Take care. God, you are our refuge. Send our ancestors to guard our doors. Cast out this virus from our communities and our bodies. Heal, bless, and protect everyone listening and their loved ones. Thank you for listening to Make It Plain and Get Woke. Remember to listen, like, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. If all minds are clear, it has been Made Plain. Thank you.